We're going to talk today about my online training and delivery journey, which started in 2009. So, um, as I know, we've all had quite radical changes happen recently. Um, my, my own changes, I began working with Curtin VTEC, which then became VTEC, which then became Goldfields Institute of Technology, which is now South Regional TAFE. And I've not moved office. I'm still in a donger in Esperance, so there we go. <laughs> Uh, I teach the Diploma in Graphic Design, uh, Preparatory Skill Sets and the Certificate 3 and Certificate 4 in pr Printing and Graphic Arts. I've been working in education since 1992. You can probably tell from my accent, I started in Britain and then moved over to Australia in 2002 and uh, got a job at Curtin VTech at the time in 2007. Uh, at that time, student numbers were okay, not great. Graphic design, Esperance, limited audience, limited market, limited industry. So really started to look at how we could expand our demographic and open up the training to a wider audience. I had dabbled in online learning and training in the UK um, and it seemed to be the way of, of moving at that time, 2008, there was a few uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, you know, pushes from, from uh, the RTOs at that time to start looking and developing to going online. So I thought, yep, it's perfect industry, let's do it. Um, and since 2009, we opened up for delivery purely online. I do no face-to-face -face contact at all. Um, and in 2013, we reached a peak of 95 students enrolled. So that was the heyday. It was pretty fantastic to have that amount of students enrolled in one year. Uh, we successfully applied f to be able to deliver across Australia in 2014, and we now have uh, students all over uh, Australia. Um, and yet, yeah, we're building student numbers across states since then. I co or have co-lectured co with Steve, who is joining us from Esperance. I'm going to cross over to him so he can actually give us a bit of his blurb. Um, at the moment, he is teaching IT online, but uh, we we have taught together uh, for a number of years. So I'll just pass on to his slide. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and welcome to the room if you're in webinar land. Uh, yes, I was bred but not born in Esperance. Um, I moved here when I was about well, six months old or something like that, so I think I could be classed as a local. Um, like Caroline, I'm a lecturer at South Regional TAFE, formerly Goldfields Institute, formerly VTech, formerly Curtin VTech. And um, I was actually here when we were just plain old Curtin, which was um, the, uh, the, um, the vocational side of Curtin University at that stage. Um, as Caroline mentioned, I lecture in IT. I have a diploma in IT, uh, Cert 3 in music, uh, technical production, and graphic design. I started teaching technical production, um, music technical production, which is basically sound engineering, that sort of thing. And then the powers that be discovered that I had a diploma in IT, so they quickly seconded me into the IT world. And then, uh, yeah, before we knew it, graphic design really started uh, going through the roof. Um, so I co-lectured with Caroline for a few years there. And now they've got me back on IDMT, which is IT with uh, digital media and technology attached to it. Um, I also do a bit of, um, well, a fair bit of ICT support for the Esperance campus. Um, as you can imagine, that's been a bit crazy with all the changeover from Goldfields to South Regional TAFE, but that's another story. Um, yes, I'm currently delivering Cert 2 and 3 in IDMT across three schools, two in Esperance and one in Kalgoorlie. Um, I've developed a course um, to be I'd say about 90% online. IT being the way it is, we'd still need uh, some regular uh, visits for a practical demonstration and assessment, that sort of thing. I have in Kalgoorlie a, um, 
a supervisor that um, is from the TAFE up there. Um, likewise, at an, another school in Esperance, I have a supervisor that um, looks after the VETA students. And as I said, I go and do regular visits just to keep in contact with them. Um, I also conduct weekly collaborate sessions for my Kalgoorlie students. Um, I'd love to say that my next mission would be to set up an online sound engineering slash recording course, but um, uh, that might be a bit of a pipe dream at this stage. <laughs> okay, Caroline, thank you, and back to you. So what I want to talk about now is, um, I suppose, what you all think about when you first hear the word online, online delivery and training. So if you can just chuck out some some words that come into your head when you hear those those that term online learning online delivery can be negative as well as positive so has anyone got any words that they can think of that just challenging absolutely collaborating, collaborating. great flexible. flexible yep any others hard <laughs> Some of the words that came to my mind before I started was, oh, it's for geeks, it's too difficult, it's n what are you going to do about compliancy? Like, how's that going to work? Um, I haven't got enough resources, I haven't got enough time, it's not going to work for my industry, um, I just, I like human interaction, how am I going to get that? Um, and, oh, it's okay, I'll just shove my PowerPoints online, that'll, that'll do it. Um, when we're looking at the new TAFE environment, I suppose Janice asked me to, um, to present here and I sort of thought, well, let's go and have a look at the statement of expectations from DTWD. And um, a key focus, it seems, when you read that document is about collaboration. So there's, there's real key areas, there's collaborative approaches, better service communities that they represent, working um, between, for linkages between metropolitan and regional colleges, um, you know, really about supporting the two colleges and the two areas. And I, I sort of figured that, well, yeah, I can see, I can really see how using online tools is going to help and to build that bridge between the colleges. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of why I think online learning um, can help with that building of the, bra the bridges and, and the collaboration. And then I'll go into some real detail about how we've done it. So I think online learning um, enhances student to student and lecturer to lecturer communication. Um, it just opens up so many different avenues for communication and lecturers, lecturers become a lot more accessible between the colleges. It enables uh, student-centred teaching approaches and we'll talk a little bit more on that later as to why I think that that's really important in the, the day and age that we are teaching in, in this environment. It provides 24-7 accessibility to your course materials, so it really removes that reliance on a physical attendance to your classes. And I think we all start to see how that can open up some interesting gates. So opening up gates it gives you an opportunity for greater options for regional learners. Um, I think it eases the ability to share resources between the colleges. Um, I think it allows us to link activities and expertise between the colleges um, and it provides access that may not be currently available. So I know that everyone's scope now has suddenly changed from what we could deliver to what we're now supposed to be delivering and or can deliver and I suppose that is how, how are we going to address that, how are we going to make that happen. Um, so using online tools I think is definitely um, one way of making that happen. Online can also provide a beautiful hub or support environment for you and your students. Um, so it allows greater peer discussion um, between, between the learners. And it also increases um, areas for lecturer support if it's managed correctly. I mean, and that we're going to talk about that later, actually managing this correctly. Um, the other one that I find that I've used it for over the last two years is validation. So I validate via Collaborate. 
Um, so I, we all get our tools and we put them in Collaborate and we pick them to pieces and we have a discussion and guess what, it's recorded. So when an auditor comes along, how are you doing validation? Well, watch these re recordings, that's how we're doing validation and listen to the in-depth conversations that are happening between you know, the, the industry and um, fellow lecturers. So, I'm going to move into detail and I forgot to mention if you have any questions as we're going along just shout them out, no problem, anything that you think of just shout out the questions. So I'm just going to start to look in detail now about how, well, I suppose the options that you have available to you as an online facilitator um, and also then jumping back to Steve and he's going to look a little more detail in, in our examples. So I think when you first start to think about online learning, it really is a little bit like being a kid in a, sh a sweet shop. I'm going to say sweet shop because I'm British, but lolly shop. Um, it's just so much stuff out there and it's so exciting. Um, YouTube, Vimeo, TED Talks, so many open um, resources, sources that are out there that are free and it's just so exciting. And I think now for us as lecturers that we really do need to um, appreciate that that learning is available to our students and be able to um, provide those alternative routes for the students to be put, putting themselves through the, the, the course and the materials that you're providing. And obviously as a lecturer, fantastic, you can incorporate it all into your course which is just so exciting. Um, we are living in an era where there's a big expectation for students to be able to learn online. They, if it's not offered online, they sort of a little bit taken a gas. I found really, you know, they they, they they need to be able to know that they that they can get this stuff online. You know, they're online all the time. So these online sources are obviously providing an alternative in, um, area of interest um, and. I think managing a set structure of content chosen by you, the lecturer, really is becoming less meaningful. Um, it's now our role is to decide what's important or relevant to your subject domain and, and the particular needs of your learners. Because you have, you've got, as you all know, we've all got different learners in our classes and different learning styles. And you can use all of these tools to really pinpoint those learning styles and get that information out in so many multiple platforms in multiple ways than we ever could before. Um, and learners are starting to take responsibility for their own learning. You know, if you want to learn something, where do we all go? YouTube. You know, your boiler's broken. Oh, I, I might be able to fix this myself. Let's go on to YouTube, you know. Can't play the guitar, I'm going to learn on YouTube. So, you know, that's what your students are doing. So you need to realise that and you need to grasp that and use it as a powerful tool. Use it yourself. Um, online, I think it's a, we really need to start changing the way we see ourselves as lecturers. Um, I, I don't see myself as the, you know, the port of all knowledge, that I deliver all knowledge to my students. I, I see myself as that sheepdog, that I am trying to guide my unwieldy students through a gate <laughs> at the end of the field and I hope I get there. So I guide, I facilitate, I assess their learning, um, I, I encourage my students to go and use alternative sources. I look at the alternative sources and I think are they useful, are they actually getting something for them, from them. So my, obviously my students are huge Instagrammers, they're huge Facebookers, but you know have a look on Facebook, what's out there? You know there's so many communities of practice out there. You know, so with graphic design, for instance, there's so many lounges, graphic design lounge, graphic design suite, graphic design hub, and they can go on there and they can put their work on there and they're networking. So they're starting that network, that global network, before they've left um, and finished their qualifications. So they're set to go out there and get that extra support when they've left. So a um, couple of ways that, I, that we do it to build um, I suppose that community and that sharing and that collaboration is the, we have a very heavy use of our discussion board. So within Blackboard is the learning management system that um, we use and um, my discussion board is just used all the time. 
Um, and, and the reason, the way that I get them to do that is by setting it as a core part of every single assessment and activity that they do. So they, they will not get a, a tick that they've passed that, that activity unless they've gone into discussion board and fed back put their own activity on there, but also fed back on somebody else's. So that actually is part of that communication in the workplace, but also builds that collaboration and it also builds that, um, you know, the student the feel, of, the feel of being part of a, of a community of people that are all doing, going towards the same goal. Uh, the other example is um, our YouTube channel. So um, we have a pretty active YouTube channel and the content on this is mainly uh, collaborate sessions that we've run that are recorded and then downloaded, turned into MT MP4, edited, so you don't get all the gumph at the beginning and the end of people, oh, I can't get in, my mic's not working, and all the rest of it that happens at the end, because it's going to happen. Technical stuff goes wrong. You just got to accept it. You know, it's not a reason to not do it, but it does go wrong. Um, and so that we create resources as we're going, which is fantastic. So again, that, that going in, checking the YouTube channel, people share, the students will share videos that they found, we put them on the channel as well as links. So again, that sort of hub that we expect students to be part of. The other one that I touched on is our Facebook page. So um, again, there's actually two Facebook pages that are for our course. So there's the main Facebook page which we have where I share content and students will share ideas on there as well. But uh, the students, like, they've set their own up as well. Um, so, which I think is a little bit more social than this one, but I'm still in that one as well. I just like to keep an eye on what they're actually getting up to. But it still has a graphic design bias, but it's, it's definitely a more social group that they've got happening there, which I think is fantastic. You know, that's great. Because the students are spread all over, so it's good for them to be able to get together in that environment. Uh, another tool that we found effective for our industry area is Behance, which um, basically the students, again I've written this into the core, core component of the course, but this is again about building that network for when they've left. So it's about using an online tool that is so good that it's, it builds that community for when, they, when they've left the community that they've had through their, their, their courses with me. Uh, Behance is basically a portfolio site, they put their work on there and students um, can feed, feedback on each other's work but also it's open to designers across the world to feedback and they're also seeing excellent design on there which lifts the game because that's the other thing with online learning because if you're in a classroom and you know Pollyanna over in the corner is amazing and getting straight A's all the time everyone tends to work towards that now I found sometimes if you don't have that in an online class then there's that sort of lowering of the expectation whereas if you lift that expectation of where, where students need to be getting to to be good in the industry that you're teaching by using online tools to show them look look what's out there then it sort of again it lifts that that level of work so there's new forms of assessment um, with our online learning that you've got to get your head around but that can really work to your advantage. So digital learning, online learning actually leaves a permanent trace. So the tracking that we've got facility through Blackboard is fantastic. So I can track exactly where my students are at, what, what they've been doing, what they've been looking at when they were last in there. And it acts as an early warning system for me to see students that perhaps are, are not engaged as much as they should be. And we can sort of deal with that accordingly. So um, obviously in a face-to-face, -face, if they're not rocking up to class, you've got that. But if there's big gaps between when they come to class and when you next see them, you don't know if they're engaged or not. Whereas I'm seeing this, I'm expecting my students to check into their course nearly every day. So I'm doing the same. Uh, we use lynda.com, fantastic resource if anyone's seen it. Um, it is, you do pay for it, um, so if you can persuade the powers that be to get a license for your campus, you're on a winner. Um, and that can be integrated into Blackboard really well. Linda's not just for graphic design software, any software that you teach, as well as marketing skills, business skills. There's just so much stuff on Linda, it's amazing. They've been going a long, long time. Um, and again, there's some fantastic uh, 
uh, tracking. Yeah, there's Steve's one of our most valuable resources, it is. And you can track what your students have been doing and what, you, what they've been watching on Linda. You can assign them playlists. So um, I assign my students a playlist of videos that I expect them to watch. And they can print off certificates of completion which can be sent to you as a PDF that's part of um, the assessment that you, you would hope that they would be getting through. Again, so you're seeing that that quality is happening, that they are actually, rather than telling them, go and watch these videos, but you've got no possibility knowing that they've done that, Linda um, gives you that option. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, tracking through Blackboard, so like I've just an example of the kind of uh, reporting that you can get, I've just zoned that in. Um, I think online learning as well is, as has been touched on a little bit today as well with some of the talks that I've been to, there really is a demand for short, just in time, just for me learning. Um, that meets the immediate need of your learner. Um, like I've just said, if we go and use watch YouTube, and I heard someone say earlier on, oh, if it's longer than 10 minutes, I'm not going to watch it. And that's the, that's what we're living in. This is what this is where we are at. People want that short, just in time, just for me. Um, and so you do need to think about when you're putting your online learning together, how you're going to cluster it, how you're going to split it up, how it's how's it going to work so it's small bite-sized pieces for the student to work through and then hopefully get to the end where they end up with a full qualification. Um, so my, my courses, uh, but all of my courses that I deliver are clustered um, and the student would work through one cluster finish that and if they want they can move on to the next cluster but if they don't want then they can actually just finish with that and they've got two units or three units. We've actually had quite a few students that have just come in to do one cluster so we have a separate cluster on web design and we've had students that have just come in just to do that. They don't want the full qualification they just want to learn web design they get four units and off they go. So, um, and, and having your, your course split into those smaller sections allows you to do that. Um, so summing up for the educational benefits before I move on to the challenges, um, and there are quite a few, um, I think it opens up learning, it makes it more accessible and flexible. The classroom no longer becomes the unique centre of learning. Um, there's an increased sharing of power between the lecturer and the learner. Um, it changes your, the lecturer's role, you're more supportive, um, your negotiation over content and methods and the developer, developing of supporting learners' autonomy and I mean we have to be autonomous with our learning when we leave um, TAFE or uni or wherever, you then become a lot more autonomous and supporting that through this level I think is a really good step. Um, and it also um, really provides that area for learners to support e each other in their learning and um, that sort of peer assessment, peer to peer to peer review and discussion groups. Okay, so challenges. Um, again, just shout out if you've got any questions. Um, so I've painted quite a rosy picture and um, it has been a really fantastic journey and I've loved every minute of it. However, there, ha there are challenges, there, there always will be. So it takes a lot of time, it really does. Um, I've been developing my content to go online since 2008 and I'm still developing it. I still rewrite it, I still reword it, I still take it off, I look at it, I take it to pieces, does it work? No, it doesn't, put it back reword it or start again and then obviously you get a training package update yay and you do it all again <laughs> so um, so you know it does take time there are a lot of fantastic e-learning resources out there that are all ready to go and bundled up and packaged um, and that's fantastic if you can find something that works for you and it's compliant and it meets all of the standards and you can put it in there as the content and then just value add around that then that's great unfortunately for graphic design there wasn't at the time anything so I did write it all but I think that for me that's been really good because I know it inside out and I know what works and what doesn't work um, and yeah for, but it has time has been a, yeah a barrier for sure. 
Also, the other aspect of the time-consuming thing is that you have to learn how to use a learning management system if you've never used one before. Um, they do take a little bit of getting used to, you know, so it's how's, how does it all work and it's quite a foreign environment, you know. It's, I went straight from face to face into teaching purely online and it was like, okay, wow, this, this feels really strange, you know, it doesn't feel right, you know, so um, you definitely need to um, get used to that. So your daily and weekly workload <laughs> feels like it's never ending. Um, because I do rolling enrolments, my students are not completing activities or assignments at the same time. They're all at different times. So I'm getting stuff in constantly and it's all different. And so I have to be on top of that all the time. So it's not like I go in, I teach a class face to face, I do my prep beforehand and then I might have some um, assessment to do. It's, it's a constant sort of stream of work to keep up with. Um, I need to be in communication with my students almost every day, um, just so I'm touching base, so they don't feel isolated and on their own. Um, they need to feel like part of a class. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes it does. Um, mostly it will happen in the discussion board. So they may have worked overnight on and been working heavily in the discussion board. I'll come in the morning and then I'm replying to the things that have gone in the discussion board. And then they're back on at night checking what I've put and then they're responding to me. So it sort of works in that cycle. But yeah, um, I do teach on at night time as well. So. Um, I check email and keeping up the discussion board all the time, but yeah, it's that communication just to keep them on task, to feel so that they don't feel isolated, that they don't feel that they've just been paid a load of money to do a course and then boom, off, you know, get on with it, off you go. So I try to respond, uh, as I say, to my quest students' questions um, as quickly as I possibly can to keep them motivated. Um, I also um, will try and get them feedback to an assessment within two days, so I sort of have this two-day turnaround. Now I know that's, that's pretty tricky and sometimes it doesn't work, but um, two, two to four days, I think, because especially for an activity, um, if it's an assessment, it might be longer. But when they've handed an assessment in, at least I'll tell them, yeah, I've got it, I'm having a look through it. It's looking good on the first space, but you know, maybe you know, I, I'll get some further feedback to you very soon. So at least they know it, they've got it and I've got it and everything's good. Because if they're just handing it in online and it goes into what cyberspace and disappears, they don't really know what's happened to it after that. So. Caroline, do you have a, a maximum number of students you take? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, don't we all have the magic number? Um, oh, look. Yeah, when it got really high, um, I think the, the most I had on my own at one point was 67, and that's when I started going, no, can't do this anymore. So that's when um, Steve was brought in on a point five FTE to help out. So yeah, um, it can get unwieldy, and you do need to be really, really sort of organized as to how you there are efficiencies, and I'm going to talk about some efficiencies in a bit. So, um, one extra point I will mark, uh, will point out as well. I think when 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 sorry, we went Caroline, online, can I ask um, you a question? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, it was just in relation to your number of students and rolling enrolments. So, obviously not when you had 67, but when you started out at first, did you ever have a situation where you just had one student doing a particular unit or cluster at a time? Oh yeah. So how did they feel part of a group then? Yeah, well, because they, they fe they're feeding into the discussion board and the other students are still feeding back onto what they're doing, and also in Collaborate, which I'll talk about in a bit, but we do online classes, everybody comes in at the same time. And we're not actually doing anything that is specifically to do with an assessment. We're talking, we're discussing, we're looking at holistic 
information. So um, we may look at how to deal with a client, say for instance, or a student might share a story that they've had. So it's that feeling part of a community, even though they, they may be a different, and to be honest, that happens all the time. They're, they are all, and maybe, I'm, I think in my diploma, I've got one student who's flying ahead and um, is completely on her own, but she still feels part of the group because she's using the discussion board and this other students are feeding back on what she she's doing and they're obviously seeing what's coming up as well so um, for the ones that are taking a little bit more time or the ones that come in later on there's a definite advantage but that discussion board is an online archive anyway so they're constantly seeing what stu other students have done and feeding back into that that as well so yeah so we get away with it that way and um, yeah did that answer your question yeah cool how do you validate um, that the student doing the assessment is the student that's enrolled in. Yeah, I'm going to talk about authenticity in yeah on one of the slides. So yeah, it's the biggest one. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, yeah, so just an extra point while we're on this slide is I think when I went online, um, it took a while for quality to come with us and factors, tazzies and taps and all the rest of it and how are you going to write that and how is that going to make sense in an online environment. I think we've got there with that now. But one area I think still needs to be looked at and addressed is I can't fill my timesheet in because how do I split my day between ARD and TCH and PD, it's impossible as an online trainer to fill that in. It's a fairy tale. So I fill it in, <laughs> do my bit, off it goes, but it's a fairy tale, it really is. So you just have to, again, the mindset of the way that you work is very different. Um, you know, you didn't hear that in the back. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, in the classroom, your students come together in one place, your announcements are made in one place, questions are asked in one place, activities are completed in one place, um, and everybody moves along beautifully. Um, online, your workload is distributed, um, your students are going to be working at different times, the questions trickle in, um, and activities that may be able to be done in one day in a classroom can take days to, to do in the online environment um, and students are not going to always get there at the same time so you do need to think about how you're going to manage that. Um, now the next bit was Steve I'm wondering shall I try jumping to him again or? What we have here is an example of the Blackboard Collaborate. Um, we hold Collaborate sessions on a regular weekly or fortnightly basis and um, the other good thing about Collaborate is you can actually have drop-in sessions which are like one-on-one -on -one sessions for one or maybe a small group of students. Um, this is very good for like doing software demos if you've got three or four students that seem to be struggling with one piece of software or something like that. Um, and as Caroline mentioned, there is a, a database archive uh, that students can always access from previous Collaborate sessions. Uh, now, our traffic lights, this is, uh, we would be absolutely lost without our traffic lights, which is um, basically an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the greyed out pieces that you can see along the top there are the student name, and so you have the activities down the side and the student name across the top and um, we obviously like to see a lot of green in those traffic lights. Um, if there's a bit of red showing up that means there's activities that haven't been sent in and uh, yes we don't like to see that. And we also have yellow or orange in there if something comes in that's not quite complete or whatever. Um, what else do we use? We use uh, email templates. Um, that makes it uh, so much easier than um, going through hundreds and hundreds of student emails. Uh, we have a template made up per um, activity or assessment and so we can just basically um, give the feedback in an already created email which is, uh, does make life a lot easier. Anyway, I'm glad you can hear me. I'll uh, hand back to Caroline. Okay, so I'm carrying on with the challenges. Um, I think when you first start 
I've talked at the earlier earlier stage about YouTube, Vimeo, all of those awesome tools, and it's like, wow, I'm going to bring them all in, every single one. That's fantastic. And I certainly did that when I first started. I'm going online. Everything's going to move. There's going to be animation. There's going to be video. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. And um, you know, you send it out there, and it's like that link doesn't work. That video is not playing. <laughs> so. I have learned um, the hard way to keep it simple. Um, so really source what is working for you and what, um, what is effective and what's actually going to value add into your course. Um, I think when we first started, our content had this lovely animation of this a line that just went up and down on the side for no reason whatsoever, just because it looked pretty. And it was breaking all the time and stopping people's content from coming in. So why did we have it there? Because we were showing off, because we're graphic designers and we like to show off. Get rid of it. So really pair it back, keep it simple, find out what's, what's working and don't waste your students' time by sending them off or getting to look at something that actually isn't relevant to what you're trying to teach. Um, because they're going to get really frustrated and they're going to go, oh, online learning sucks. So, and that's not what you want. Um, I'll jump, I'll just talk about this one. So just an example. So in addition to Linda, um, we have found uh, a few tools that are really effective. And you just need to go and do some searching, but also get your students to find them too. So I've got a forum in my discussion board, which is called Cool Things, you know, like anything cool that you find that's relevant. Put it in here and I'll go and have a look. And if I think it's worthwhile, then it actually ends up getting brought into the uh, assessment sometimes. So this one, for instance, is a really cool colour game where it actually, actually, they actually pick out colours and hues. And, but in, we've, we've been uh, had problems of links breaking, so there was Mr Frisky's pre-press quiz. Should have known from the name that maybe that wasn't going to be there forever, and it wasn't. <laughs> and I had it as, a, as an activity and, oh, OK, now we've got to rewrite Mr Frisky's pre-press quiz ourselves, which we did, but... Um, so yeah, uh, and obviously being prepared to, I've just gone ahead two slides, being prepared to, um, this is one, a screenshot from Steve, which I just thought was hilarious. So being prepared to change things as you change. <laughs> so, so yeah, just, uh, <laughs> we're all gonna be doing that shortly. Just delete that logo, move it on. Okay. Um, already touched on this, but your activities and assignments are going to need a lot of adjustment to work it online and you need to try them out, you need to experiment. I do a lot of group work with my students and we do that in Collaborate. So we set group activities, they'll go off, do the activities and they come back as a group to, to talk about that. Now Collaborate Ultra, I'm very sad, doesn't have breakout rooms but I've just talked to Chris and he's like my bad we're going to get them happening again for you because I use that a lot in the old collaborate we used to have breakout rooms we would dump all the students into their separate little rooms they'd have uh, a leader who would take control of their room they would do the activity and then they'd come back into the main room they'd share their whiteboard and we would discuss as a group what they've just done it's fantastic to be able to do that it really was um, so the on online content building, again, um, it really isn't as simple as just shoving your PowerPoints online. You really do need to look out, to stepping outside your comfort zone. We've t talked about, so there's been quite a few people talking about that today, being brave and uh, re-looking re at everything that you've already got in a face-to-face -face environment and thinking about how is it going to work and be prepared to scrap something. You know, something you may have spent hours preparing and developing and thinking, this is going to be fantastic. It's really going to work. Try it out. If it doesn't work, either rework it or get rid of it. And sometimes you just have to be, unfortunately, a little bit uh, um, ruthless. Um, getting your students ready for industry, that's what we're all about. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about how we've done that um, in with using uh, Collaborate. So. Um, I use Collaborate all of the time and one of the biggest things i found has just been fantastic is I get industry experts to come and talk to my students and Collaborate. And I've had some gods and goddesses of the design world that I've been cheeky and gone, hey, I teach online, 
would you come and talk to my students? And they've all gone, oh, online, that sounds cool. How does that work? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. Because they just, they don't have to go anywhere. They're not having to get on a plane. They're not having to come down to Esmonds as much as you'd want to come to Esmonds. It's beautiful. They don't have to do that. They can sit at home with a glass of wine and come into, my, into the Collaborate and talk to my students. And they can talk about industry perspective of graphic design. They can talk about what it takes to, to be a designer in the real world. They share their work. They, they, they're just, it's just fantastic. And the students can ask questions. And guess what? We record it. And then we put that on our YouTube channel as a private link for our students and, or public if the industry expert is happy for us to share that content. And then that's a resource then that's there forever. And it's there for following students the next year. So a student goes, oh, you know, I really would like to hear about how to present to a client. Oh, well, Rare came in last year and they did a great presentation on how to present to a client. It's on our YouTube channel. Go and watch it. So we're constantly getting um, industry experts in. And, you know, you can be anything that I like. I'm not... I know a little bit about sustainability, but it's not my expert area. But I can basically go and find somebody that it is their expert area, and they can come and talk to my students on that behalf. On that, so we, I think that's just brilliant. The other one that we do that um, as student that when I've back, been back into industry. Um, the biggest thing was that your students are not industry prepared. They're not ready for the speed of the way that work needs to be done in the real world. They need to be able to turn a job around in two hours. And this is another thing that I use Collaborate for. So I'll set them a brief two hours before the session and they come in and they share what they've done in Collaborate two hours later. It's not assessed. Okay, so the pressure's off that way, but at least it gives them that challenge. And they love it. They absolutely love it. They, they just, oh, when are we doing the next one? You know, so the, the Cert 3 level get a 24-hour brief, but the Diploma level is a two-hour brief. So, and that's, it, again, it's quite exciting and another engaging way for them to be part of Collaborate. So, and just move along quickly. Um, so, yep. Students need <laughs> intrinsic motivation. Um, so tr traditional classroom, you're standing near them and you hope that they're doing their work and they're not on Facebook. Um, but if they are, they're obviously in a community of practice, so it's all good. Um, so you really do need to keep tracking your students, keeping, as I've talked before, keeping it in tabs, emailing them, texting them, dropping into discussion board, keeping them engaged with what you're doing. Um, and yeah, already touched on this, but that you can see there that a, a snapshot of one of the activities where the core component is peer-to-peer -peer review. Um, so they have to um, put their work on there, but then they need to review another student's work. And that is part of every activity that goes out. Online learning is flexible, but it doesn't mean it's there's no deadlines. Um, I learned the hard way with this one. I, I started out, it's flexible, do it when you want. Yep, got to October, there was no work coming in at all, you know. So I set deadlines for my students. So when they sign up, they get a schedule. It's an individualized schedule, um, which has dates on, which pretty much like, looks like a snippet from the traffic lights. Um, flexible means that they choose when they want to learn. You know, so evening, they're working, um, early morning, whenever, they choose. That's the flexible component. You need to accept that online learning actually isn't for everybody. It's not going to fit everybody. Um, basically making sure that you're really trans transparent about what you do and how you do it at the very get-go. And giving them a go, you know, and really supporting them through as much as you possibly can. But at the end of the day, if they've given it a good go and you've supported them as much as they can and they're just not, not enjoying that, that process, it's just not going to work and you need to be mindful that, that that's the case. Getting feedback is really important, just as it is in on um, face to face. But uh, obviously, in online, you can set um, anonymous surveys, um, and I certainly set anonymous surveys for my students. They go out twice a year, 
and the students will fill out um, basically what's working and what's not. So one of the feedbacks we got from last year was we love the activities in Collaborate, set more of them, less tutorials. Yes, okay, that's what we've done. So finding that feedback. The other challenge is it can be very lonely as a lecturer. Mm. You can feel sorry for me. Um, you do feel sometimes very isolated and quite on your own. So the more you guys go online, great, because we can form a, our own little hub of, of, of online lecturers and, and be able to support each other in our journeys, which is be great. And going back to the question that was asked, compliancy. I think building um, a history with your students, so pre-enrolment, right from the very get-go. Pre-enrolment starts, you start talking to the student. When they start enrolling, you are checking the authenticity the whole time. So they're coming in to collaborate, they're talking about their work. They're putting their work up into, onto the discussion board, they're talking about their work. They're sharing right from, so with a graphic design brief, they're giving me right from sketch to final product and I'm talking to them the whole way through so you really build a new you know get to know the nuances of their language and um, you get a holistic view of each student and where they're at so um, they do sign on their work as well that it's authentic but really that's not really any worth but it's building that history with the student and when they're in collaborate talking to them and talking to them about their work as well so and on webcam as well so we just jumped quickly to um, hearing from my students. Um, yes, checking. Can you hear me? We certainly can, loud and clear. Uh, great. So I'm currently in West Perth. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much at home. I'm in my study room. And um, now, why did you decide to choose an online course, Kevin? Um, well, I already told um, Carla about it. I work full time on a ship roster. I, I work for the health department, so I have to be available to work 24 seven. So for this reason, I won't be able to do a face-to-face -face course. So, um, however, I can you know, work around my roster on my free time and commit to the online course. Ah, uh, yep, cool. Um... And what have you enjoyed about the online learning? Uh, I think the, the flexibility is what I like, is um, I'm able to study from home. I like the online sessions every fortnight with the lecturer and, the, and my fellow uh, classmates. I really enjoy going to the discussion board, I'm uploading my assignments, discussing about um, my words with the other students and help each other, like, you know, if we have any problems, like if we were in a, cl in a real classroom. Okay, all right, we're gonna have to move along, Kevin. I need to make, let's go with Robin. Okay, so Robin, um, what have you enjoyed about the online learning experience? Um, well, I enjoy it because it's flexible, because I'm actually living in Darwin in Northern Territory, so it's, um, quite hard to be face to face obviously with different. And um, so what would you find the challenges of the online course would be? Well the ma main challenges for me is um, the time zone like I said um, because there's an hour and a half difference between Northern Territory and Australia so that would be my main challenge um, and as Carolyn touched on it's just sort of not having the peers in the same room as you so you sort of you, you tend to sort of not hurry through your assignments as quickly as maybe you should be. Uh, so creating your own deadlines okay um okay carly steve i'm based in esperance so it is a bit weird doing something online knowing your lecturer is just down the road um i've really loved the online learning experience i wanted to learn graphic design but knew absolutely nothing about it. So I needed something that was simple um, and easy to do, but I also needed something that I could do from home as I work full time. And the cost of traveling to Perth would have just been prohibitive of doing something up there. So it's, it's given me something that's flexible and good and works with exactly what I need it to do, which is great. Fantastic. 
All right, thank you, our students, and I'd better hand back to Caroline right now because we're very rapidly running out of time. Okay, so summing up, um, I think get support from your institute, um, have a robust online learning strategy, start slow, take your time, work out what you're going to need, work out who can help you, keep adapting, keep changing, keep learning, ask for help and get feedback and most of all enjoy the process. Thank you Carolyn. Um, for the um for the people in the room, just so you don't miss out on the questions that came through the chat window, Steve was fielding questions in the chat while Karen was presenting, and there was one about how do you make sure videos don't basically get stolen if you put them up on YouTube and those kind of things. And his response was, A, they make it an unlisted link um, so that only students that are enrolled get sent that link, but also just with any other material, um, it, be it printed or whatever, it's down to the integrity of the student not handing that on, um, which I think is a really good point. Um, and also there was lots of discussion about the use of Facebook and closed Facebook groups and stuff like that. Yeah. So just to make sure you guys didn't miss out on any of the thing that was happening online. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Authorised by the Government of Western Australia, Perth.